I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Sri Lanka. Mr. President, Excellencies, thank you for convening this assembly to reflect on the report of the Secretary General on the work of the organization. My delegation also thanks the Secretary General for presenting his priorities today for the year 2022. As the Secretary General states, the global health, social, economic, and human rights crises triggered by the pandemic have underscored the importance of multilateral cooperation and tested it to the limit. However, underlying all these challenges are lingering questions of the nature of global health security today. One recalls that the international sanitary conferences of the 19th century, the forerunner of today's international health regulations, were concerned with making sure of Europe's protection against epidemic diseases of special origin while minimizing the interference with international commerce. It is yet to be seen as to what extent the new conception of global health built into the 2005 IHR truly departs from this Western bias. It has been said that the securitization of public health steers policy responses towards military solutions, quarantines, and border control, which are not conducive to the achieving of lasting responses to the health of our communities. We are of the view that it is necessary to identify a concept or policy of global health that has the capacity of responding to these concerns. In this context, Sri Lanka commends the leadership of the Secretary General in navigating the UN through these difficult times. UN efforts have been central to the pandemic response by assisting over 160 countries in tackling health, humanitarian, social, and economic impacts, especially through creating and operationalizing the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator at its COVAX facility through which Sri Lanka has benefited in administering vaccines to our people. Vaccine equity is the key to overcoming this evolving pandemic. As we have repeatedly heard in this August assembly, no one is safe until everyone is safe. A recently suggested approach is to integrate better a concept of medical humanitarianism in the overall scheme of global health security. Mr. President, the pandemic has had devastating effects on our hard-won developmental goals, setting back significantly the SDG agenda of countries. Promotion of sustained economic growth and development should be at the core of our efforts through increased partnerships and cooperation on the global agendas, including, among others, the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement, and the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. The development pillar needs to be allocated with sufficient resources through the UN regular budget, without any caveat. It is also crucial to scale up efforts in financing for development, and in this regard, the initiatives by the Secretary General are noteworthy. It is also significant to consider the multifaceted challenges faced by the developing economies. The specific challenges of each country needs to be considered, and resources made available in designing recovery efforts, especially of the sectors that have been hardest hit, such as tourism. Excellencies, we commend the UN's climate action leadership spearheaded by the United Nations Environment Program. As we recover from the pandemic, we need to recover cleaner and greener. We hope that the UN would continue the momentum generated by COP26. In this regard, Sri Lanka, as part of its nationally determined contributions, adopts a firm no to new coal power plants and is implementing green policies aimed at ensuring that 70% of its energy generation by 2030 would be from renewable energy sources with a long-term goal of making Sri Lanka a carbon neutral country by 2050. It must be appreciated that in assessing whether climate change has security implications, we must look at the nature of the impacts. Climate change, Mr. President, has had serious impact on lives and livelihoods. We are all familiar with the list of consequences. It is suggested that we think of climate change as a human rights issue to help us see that it is not just a matter of aggregate costs and benefits of winners and losers, of the powerful preventing the political system from acting to protect the many who are powerless. Mr. President, 
Sri Lanka also takes note with appreciation the expertise and technical assistance provided at the regional level, especially by the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific in our region. Sri Lanka was also pleased to chair the fourth ministerial conference on transport of the UNSCAP in Bangkok, at which the ministerial declaration on sustainable transport development in Asia and the Pacific and a new regional action program for 2022-2026 aligned with the three pillars of sustainability and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development were adopted. Mr. President, we also appreciate the support extended by the UN through a range of activities in the area of international peace and security, through political peace building and peacekeeping operations, the Secretary General's call on a global ceasefire and the Action for Peacekeeping Initiative. We commend the service rendered by the UN personnel all around the globe. Sri Lanka also reaffirms its commitments to international peace and security and stands ready to increase our contingent of peacekeepers in UN peace operations. We are mindful of the fact that in the decades since its creation, peacekeeping has undergone several changes. The traditional form of peacekeeping where peacekeeping forces consisted of lightly armed troops deployed to serve in a neutral capacity has today evolved into multidimensional operations, largely as a result of the changing dynamics of conflict from interstate to intrastate. Mr. President, in conclusion, while we assure our fullest support for the work of the organization and look forward to the realization of the objectives outlined by the Secretary General in what will undoubtedly be another challenging year, we must, however, remind ourselves of the critique that the UN was courting a loss of authority for a multitude of reasons and that our debates and discussions have been described as something akin to the dialogue of the deaf, perhaps unfairly. Unfair though it may be, we need to change that perception without delay in what has now been presented to us as a new normal in which we can build back better in a spirit reflective of the real humanity that we are all blessed with as members of one human family. Mr. President, may I also take this opportunity to thank the work of the UN office in Sri Lanka, which partners with our government to give meaning to these glo common global values, which we share as part of our common mission. Be assured of our support. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Sri Lanka.